Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm very delighted to be part of this uh, learning week or learning experience. Um, I am Unam Sumzadze, who is currently um, the head of versioning as well as relationships at Fundo One Day, and also a, a member of the RECEP team at the University of Stellenbosch. So today I'll be giving you a quick glimpse or a snapshot of the South African context in relation to multilingualism, um, a language policy, and um, some interesting fun facts. So sit back. I'll promise I'll be very brief um, and enjoy. All right, so before I start, I think it's very important for me just to take you for just a moment um, down my memory lane and, uh, and try to recreate or, 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 or to paint you a picture of what did South Africa look like before the new democratic South Africa. Okay? And this is going to be very important as we move along or as you try to understand some of the multilingualism complexities that the country has. So um, in South Africa, pretty much um, before 1994, everything was racially segregated. So you had different schools for different races and for people who came from different cultures. Okay? And um, as a country, we only had four provinces. Within these provinces, um, you, you, you would generally have a, a native administration, and the native administration basically took care of the indigenous or the native people's affair, okay, or affairs, <laughs> not affair, affairs. And, um, and as a country, we only had um, two uh, national official languages, that was English and Afrikaans, even though that we had about 80% of the population was um, uh, native Africans, right? So which meant that the two official languages catered to only roughly about 20% of, of the population. African languages, they were not necessarily seen as official languages, but they were recognized at a homestead level. Remember, homestead level was the administration within the province that basically took care of, of, of the black, black uh, or native people's affairs. So you, it was okay for you to speak your language. It was okay for you to go to the post, post office. And, and if, you, if you come across someone who can communicate with you in your African languages, you were allowed to do so. It was purely just on spoken basis, but in official, in official um, government policies, documents, the country only recognized English and Afrikaans. Very also importantly that in, 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 from 1974, they introduced what we call the Bantu education system, which basically said that from the sixth grade, okay, all Africans will be taught in either English or Afrikaans. So you're allowed to be taught in your, in your home language for the first six years, but from there, it was strictly Afrikaans and English. I mean, I wasn't born at this time yet, but um, when I speak to teachers that were in school during this time, and obviously uh, elderly family members, people in the community, um, uh, they would say that literally that, that the ministry had people inspecting this, this act and making sure they would randomly come to schools to make sure and to double check that teachers are not using their African languages to teach and that they were using Afrikaans and English primarily and only. Now let's fast forward to the democratic South Africa um, and how basically the country's landscape currently looks like is that instead of four provinces, we now have nine provinces. Okay. Um, up to date, we're looking at about 59 million um, population in the country, uh, and and we have progressed. We really have progressed from two official languages. Now we recognise 11 official languages, and 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 that includes the nine African languages or the indigenous languages 
um, that in the past was never or were never recognized. Um, also importantly to note that we're looking at about 79.2% of the population in South Africa are black Africans. So it is the it is um, majority of, of, of the race in the country, which the spread according to um, uh, which language um, that, that that is, I would say, predominantly is Isuzu, is the mostly spoken language in South Africa, or the African language um, that is mostly spoken, followed by Isikosa. Okay, but I think the important thing here is that we are now starting to come closer in realizing our multilingual goals or our nation building um, goals as a country that we had aimed ourselves for past 1994. Okay, um, and further than that, as I mentioned previously, that um, although there were as a recognition of African languages at a province level, okay, the change now is that for each province. Um, they have the the right, I suppose, to be able to choose its own um, official language because depending where you are or which province you situate in um, will depend on what is the most spoken language in that province. So as a nation, we recognize all, all 11 official languages. And at a provincial level, you also are able to say, well, listen, I'm in Western Cape, for example, and the most spoken languages here is English, Afrikaans, and then Isikosa. And, and a province has the legislation right to be able to, to, to put forward its own um, official languages, but it needs to be one of the 11 official languages. And I think most importantly, and most progressively, is that um, to date, our, our education system is centralized. So we no longer have schools that are racially based or schools that are or culturally based, or schools that are ethnic city based. Um, now, anyone can go to any school. You've got the right to be able to apply and go to any school that you want to, and you're not going to be denied access to the school because of the language that you speak or because of the, the, the race or the color of your skin. So, which means that with all these new changes and um, recognition of race and, and languages in South Africa also meant that as a country um, there were many things that we had to take into account um, that perhaps was not such an issue prior to 1994. And I think the biggest part of that is, is or at least for the education sector, um, was obviously providing quality education across all um, schools and as well as um, the the multilingualism aspect um, that came with um, recognizing or having 11 official languages as opposed to two languages. What did this mean for the education sector? What does this mean for the ministry in itself? I mean, a lot of these things, um, I think, and that's the point of this week, is that we we try to understand and thrash this and, and, and understand the the broader policy impl implications of it um, and uh, curriculum implications, if there are any. But just to highlight quickly sort of the high-level challenges um, that we faced uh, or, and we are still facing to some extent are things like there are certain areas of or provinces in South Africa that show, demonstrate extreme multilingualism um, or are multilingual dense. For instance, provinces like Gauteng, Limpopo, and Bumalanga typically have more than three official languages, whereas the other six provinces range between literally two to three. Okay, and also very much also to note that the most spoken language in South Africa is Isuzulu, with up to about 23% of the population. And usually you'd find it as Zulu speakers, home language speakers across more across most provinces. So you would find them in Eastern Cape, in KwaZulu Natal, you would find them in Pumalanga, you would find them in Gauteng. And this is the majority of the population. And then um, more recently is that uh, we're also starting to observe an, um, I mean, uh, learners and kids in the system um, that are from international immigrant families. So we're looking at about 7.2% uh, of the population in South Africa are international mig migrants. Um, and obviously, like, we are humans, and 
we are communicators and we bring our identity and part of our identity is also language. So we are now starting to have a very unique um, and very interesting um, sort of pattern in, in, in within the country in terms of languages that we're seeing a lot more um, international African languages, um, which which have, has now been added into the mix of of just the 11 official languages that we have. I think to just to highlight that in education, there are two key documentations or policies that lead or guide the education in implementation or education policies. The first one, of course, is our constitution. Um, and because language historically or previously or before 1994 was used as one of the key instruments in, in the divide, it was very important that the language issue gets re readdressed in the new South Africa for all sorts of reasons like nation building, um, uh, and so forth, uh, identity, culture, and all of those aspects um, that the apartheid regime perhaps der derived um, the local or the natives. So the constitution basically states that uh, every learner has the right to receive a basic education in the languages of his or her choice, where this is reasonable. Okay, and like I mentioned to you earlier on in the beginning of the presentation is that during apartheid, um, learners were had limited access um, in being taught in their home language. So this constitutional act or right um, readdresses that issue. And then on the other side, on the other hand, um, is our basically our curriculum policy or what we call our language and education policy, which basically stipulates that from grade one to three, um, learners can be taught in the, in, in, in the language or in the home language chosen by the school. And then from grade four onwards, learners are then taught subject areas in English. For instance, I learn how to read in my home language for the first three years of schooling. And then from grade four onwards, when I'm starting to do specific subject areas like maths, science, social skills, etc., those or that I'm being taught in, in English. So very important to note, and I think in, in, in this upcoming week's discussions. So just to paint you a picture of that um, language policy, uh, some, some, some stats there, as you can see that majority kids in the system um, from grade one to four, they are taught in, in, in all, you've got, there are kids that are being taught in all official languages, but when you shift to grade four, you see that majority of the kids do the crossover to having English as a language of learning and teaching. I think the most biggest question, at least current debate in South Africa now, is whether are we achieving our multilingual goals, seeing that we've got a political history of language divide. Is the education system doing justice in readdressing um, language issues, and particularly in education? And how well are we doing it? Or are we even doing it? So here it's just to highlight that, yes, indeed, we have now um, given language status uh, to all official languages and all indigenous languages within the education sector, which was not there previously. And that there's a nationwide recognition of the importance of accessing or to access um, home language teaching, whereas in the past, it was not always the case. So I think as a country, and we know this through research and, and many um, uh, uh, social linguistic theories and, and theories on how kids uh, or learners learn, um, is that a, a, a good foundation in a home language serves as a, a, a stepping stone towards any uh, teaching or learning in an additional language. So yes, we do recognize that it's important to give access to home language and the curriculum or the policy at least gives leeway for this up until the first three years of the schooling. And then from, from grade four, it's in English. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, that also just touches on my last point that we all on the same page, I would say, from from uh, government, researchers, schools, teachers and parents and so forth. 
Another way of looking of whether we've achieved our multilingual policies or our language and education policies is seeing really how our learners are performing in their own languages. This is another way of looking at it. Um, this is just a dipstick of the Pearl's Literacy Assessment um, that South Africa took part in. Um, uh, unfortunately, we in the early grades, there is no last national assessment. Um, we did have one called the another annual national assessment, but due to being highly contested by teachers and, and unions, it had to be it had to be discontinued. So at the moment, we rely a lot on international studies to give us a sense of how the curriculum or how the curriculum is being implemented in schools. So basically, the takeaway point here is that. Um, even after three years of being taught in your home language, okay? And remember, your home language in schools is chosen by the school, right? Um, and often it would happen that kids will go to the nearest school. And because now we're living in an integrated society and we no longer live according to race or tribes, etc., and we're very interculturally, um, it's very difficult to determine some instances, um, in particularly in your highly dense provinces like Kaoteng, uh, uh, a, a clear and simple and straightforward um, language of learning and teaching. But the take home here is that after three years of being taught in your own home language, this is your own home language, right? Um, English and Afrikaans still outperform the native African languages. So the question is, are we really achieving our language goals? Are we really achieving our equal, lang equal educational language policy goals? And just to kind of wrap off with um, um, some current debates, as, as, as I mentioned previously in my previous slide, that some of these we are still exploring and we're still unpacking. We're still trying to understand this multilingual phenomena. Um, and as much as we are almost 20 years plus into the new South Africa and multilingual South Africa, um, we still do not have clear-cut answers. So what is currently happening in South Africa, according to the sector, is that um, there's a debate around whether we should do home language teaching in the first three years or versus, or versus up to the first six years of schooling. You know, when do we do the transition from home language into English? When is it the good time? Right? Big, big, big debate in South Africa. Um, and interesting enough, the transition in the post or in apartheid um, happened after six years. And then another interesting, a very pioneering work which is happening in one of our provinces is that now they are allowing learners um, in matric to write exams or to be at least to have access in reading the question papers in their own home language. Is it Kosa in the sense, or at, at, uh, referring to this province specifically? So, which means that even if I'm being taught science in English, um, in matric, and matric is the final um, high school examination. So, even if I'm being taught English, or to, um, excuse me, even if I'm being taught science in English, um, if I feel more comfortable of, of accessing that examination paper in my home language, which is, which is, is a course, I'm able to do so. So this is quite pioneering work, or at least in my opinion, this is the route towards trying to achieve our, our multilingual um, goals as a country. And then I think um, the fourth, third one there is that there's a strong, strong, strong argument to the use of um, specific strategies like translanguaging and code switching um, as an integrated process of learning, of teaching and learning. Um, there have been studies in South Africa that are exploring, um, you know, these different methods of, of communication modes or of teaching um, uh, uh, learners in the system. Um, but I must say, we have not had, um, uh, at least in my opinion, sort of medium to large scale evidence of, of to what extent um, does translanguaging or code switching um, in South Africa um, to be able to inform the policy. Uh, but there is a lot of work and a lot of researchers are experimenting with these modes and are trying to understand it. And I, and I, and, and I think uh, very soon 
we're going to be able to have enough evidence um, to bring forward into the policy discussions and the policy implement- implementation discuss- discussions of multilingualism. And then obviously, lastly, and I think one as a country we need to reflect on is that in a sense, as much as we are a multilingual um, country, there's very little economical rewards in South Africa if you are multilingual. Um, and and this goes hand in hand at whether as a nation do we think um, or do we believe that there is an importance um, and, and and there's a need for for kids to 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 have uh, or those that are in multilingual contexts to have and to embrace the multilingualism um, in South Africa and I think we know globally um, the economic language is English so we tend to see that. Um, uh, parents in themselves, they would prefer to put their kids um, in English schools where they will have maximum access and, and, and maximum opportunities to be taught in English because there's this belief that then if you have good English uh, skills, uh, speak English very well, um, that that could possibly um, better your your economic activity um, in your future or in your career. So there's a very disjunctive um, Perception about uh, what our our education system is trying to achieve, but on the other hand, what the labour market demands. So, and these are things that if we try to embrace multilingualism as a country, um, we need to look at it at a holistic aspect and not necessarily just for education. What does it mean for the labour market? What does multilingualism mean for the higher education and training sector? Um, so these are the current debates that are happening in South Africa at the moment. Um, and um, 